on Overdrive today, we check out how fuel efficient the all-new Toyota Highrider Hybrid actually is, get you an exclusive drive of the upcoming Hyundai Creta, bring you a closer look at Ferrari's first hybrid V6 road car, and celebrate the winners of Mercedes-Benz's Frame the Star contest. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Soini That We finally got behind the wheels of the 2022 Toyota Highrider to find out whether the hybrid tech is the way to go forward in this popular SUV body style to bring high efficiency to the masses. With the price of fuel going through the roof, everyone's looking past petrol, diesel to hybrid and this is the first mass market SUV hybrid that we have in India and it promises quite a bit. We're going to see if it can deliver. First off, Urban Cruiser High Rider is a mouthful, so let's all agree on just High Rider. Going by how it looks in the metal versus photos, it's got this great mini Fortuner Legender feel thanks to the shape of the lights and squared off bumpers front and rear. It all comes together to make the High Rider appear larger and wider than some of its rivals. This thing is actually the longest SUV in the segment, barring the forgotten Nissan Kicks. This hybrid model has a few external differentiators over the non-hybrid models including the nicely executed carbon fibre finished grille panel up front. The polished split spoke snowflake 17 inch wheels look absolutely brilliant too, especially on the go. Now the cabin of the high rider might feel overly familiar if you're familiar with Maruti Suzuki or recent Toyota cars. Cars that have the shared platform like the new Beleno Glanza and Brezza and Urban Cruiser. For example, though the steering wheel looks identical to what's on the new Brezza, it's not flat-bottomed and has different mounted controls. Moving on, there's a smattering of soft-touch surfaces around the cabin and that really makes it feel premium. But there is one small thing that we're going to nitpick about and that's the fact that the steering wheel feels a little too far inboard, so it almost feels off-center. The features list has everything you expect in a car nowadays like wireless smartphone integration, wireless charging, ventilated seats, auto dimming IRVM, connected tech and much more. What's missing are rain sensing wipers and only the top end non-hybrid models get the Archimus branded audio. The driver's seat set for my height of 5'10 and a half and I've got plenty of knee room down here. I wish I had a little more under thigh support and considering I've just got a couple of fingers of headroom I think Passengers taller than maybe six foot might find their head brushing against the roof. Of course, you can slouch down in the seat a bit. The angle of recline on these seats is adjustable, but keep in mind that that was the most relaxed setting and this is the second setting which I find far too upright. In fact, even at its more relaxed position, I wish it went back just a little further, but that isn't as big an issue as this excess of lumbar support that I seem to feel. I think it might settle down once the car actually breaks in and gets a little older. Keep in mind, these are brand new cars with less than 100 kilometers on the clock. But it's a comfortable place to be and it's accentuated by that absolutely massive panoramic sunroof with the twin panes that actually retract all the way. The middle passenger has their own adjustable headrest. There is a fold-out armrest and that middle passenger also has their own three-point seat belt. Twin AC vents, USB Type-C charge port and a regular USB charge port complete out the list of features back here. Toyota doesn't have a number for the boot capacity yet but space is limited by the battery pack that's mounted behind the 60-40 split rear seats. The boot is wide but stacking luggage will foul with the parcel tray. If you've got an airport run or a long trip with a load of luggage, consider leaving the parcel tray at home. As we know, the High Rider gets two 1.5-litre petrol powertrains. Neo Drive variants have the Maruti Suzuki K15 four-cylinder engine with a five-speed manual available in front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, or a six-speed automatic front-wheel drive variant. Now, the variant that we are most interested in is the hybrid, and that's actually the one that we're getting to drive today. It's powered by a 1.5-litre three-cylinder petrol engine, naturally aspirated, running the Atkinson cycle, it puts out 92 PS of power and 122 Newton meters of torque. Now there is that electric motor slash generator helping it out and the motor puts out 80 PS on its own and 144 Newton meters of torque. Together, you've got a combined 116 PS of power. 
Toyota self-charging hybrid or series parallel hybrid aka strong hybrid tech debuted in the Prius over two decades ago and is in its fourth generation now with a new lithium-ion battery and variable valve timing on the ICE for better thermal efficiency and performance. Now the hybrid system works a little differently than the hybrid system you may or may not be familiar with in the Honda City Hybrid. The electric motor has a generator that starts the ICE engine up to warm it up on cold starts and actually heat up catalytic converter to keep those emissions in check which also means that on cold starts you will hear the engine fire up to kind of charge up those batteries if the charge is low. Versus the hybrid tech in the Honda City eHEV for example, in the Highrider Hybrid the engine drives the front wheels directly via stepless eCVT often also charging the battery at the same time. An EV only mode allows for pure electric driving under speeds of 40 km per hour and at low throttle openings if there's enough charge in the low capacity 0.76 kWh battery. EV only range is not a figure that Toyota discloses because there's just so many variables. It does have an EV mode button which forces it into electric only mode but the system figures out what's best for it in keeping the battery between 40 to 60 percent. What that means is for about 60% of the time that you're driving around in the city, the high rider will be driving around on electric power only. In the driving conditions that we expect most people to actually use the high rider most of the time, it feels perfectly seamless and there definitely always is enough on tap to get you going. While we didn't get a chance to test the efficiency, the instrumentation did display numbers as high as 23 km per litre with a mix of urban highway driving. Now the ride quality of the high rider is something that I have to say surprised me quite a bit. It does feel very well damped. So even over bad roads, you don't really get those bumps filtering through with a jewel. It does feel like it's soaking up quite a bit. That does mean that there is body roll, but again, it's very well controlled. The high rider also handles more than adequately well. It is a front wheel drive car so you do feel the front end start to push a little bit when you try and carry too much speed into a corner. But it does go into a nice sort of understeery slide which you can correct very very naturally. It looks like the high rider does a good job of packaging the practicality that people like in SUVs with what most of us like in any case and that's efficiency. This is one hybrid that might not need you to give up too much for that extra efficiency and lower emissions. We expect pricing on the high rider hybrid to be very competitive against the diesel automatic variants of its chief rivals that should put it in the rupees 18.5 lakh range X showroom. If that's the case, the high rider may be Toyota's next fortuner in dominating the segment and not just in the way it looks. Well, do head into our YouTube channel and in the comment section, do let us know that if you weren't bound by a body style, which hybrid would you choose in India today? Would it be the Honda City Hybrid or would it be the Toyota High Rider Hybrid? We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll acquaint you with the upcoming Hyundai Creta. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. The 2023 Hyundai Creta is headed our way. It will have a Tucson inspired styling. There will be some changes in the cabin as well and it will get an improved safety tech. Now Rohit was in Thailand recently and he got a chance to exclusively drive this car. We've always said that the Creta started looking a lot radical compared to the model that debuted in the Indian market. And now they've gone even more radical. This design is inspired by the new Hyundai Tucson. The dimensions of the updated Creta remain unchanged, but you won't mistake it for any other car from the Hyundai lineup, thanks to its unique shape and silhouette. The big change, of course, when I say a Tucson inspired design, are these discrete daytime running lights. So, what you get now is three lights, the shape of which is exactly similar to the detailing that you see on the grill. And when they go off, they are completely discrete, they are hidden, you can't really see them. The headlights, you had a three pot arrangement on the current generation of the Creta. When it goes out, what you get with the new car are these two pot headlights, and then you also get the turn blinkers that are integrated right here within this assembly. I think it's a very handsome looking design. It has completely changed the look of the Creta for the third time now. That Tucson inspired face, dark chrome treatment on the grille and subtle changes to the bumper help achieve a more premium look. At the rear, 
the black strip connecting the two tail lights is gone but could be retained on the India spec model along with a seamless strip of LEDs similar to the new venue. On the tail, you continue to get the spaced Creta lettering. The design of the tail light may not look very different to you, but there are a few changes here. Let, let me show you that on the illuminated tail light. You get this extension in the tail light, which I think looks quite good. You also get a new detailing, a new uh, crease, so to say, on the tailgate, which again helps uh, kill the monotony of the tail light. The wheels on this model are very similar to the current India spec car. But we could get new design options that are inspired by the new Creta N-Line that was shown globally. And that will also debut with this facelift. So in terms of the cabin, the Thailand model doesn't get the bigger screen that we already get in the Indian Creta. So that screen will continue to operate even in the new Creta when this one arrives there. It will have more connected tech uh, than uh, what the current car has. It will also have wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto. The wireless charger was always there, but these two functionalities will be added. The other bit is the instrumentation. It will now be carried over from what we've seen in the Hyundai Alcazar. One other bit uh, for securing the cabin in terms of the safety is going to be this additional camera. Not this camera that you see, this is a dash cam. But there is a camera in this unit and that will essentially, that forward facing camera will essentially enable uh, ADAS functionality for this car. There's going to be no radar guided cruise control system because there's no radar, but there will be the camera. So you will get a lane keep assist, a lane change warning. It also has a blind spot assistant on this particular variant. I don't know if it will come to India, but I hope it does. So the Creta that is sold in the Thai market, it comes from Indonesia. That is where the new plant is, that is where it's built. But in India, of course, it will be built in Chennai. India will also get different engine options. For example, the car that I'm driving right now is the 1.5 litre petrol. That will continue to be the base model for the Indian variant. And India will also get the 1.4 turbo petrol and it will continue to have the 1.5 diesel as well. Because even now, even with the kind of pricing that uh, the fuel companies are asking for, diesel still remains a popular choice for the Creta lineup. The 1.5 naturally aspirated petrol will come with the IVT or Hyundai's version of the CVT and the intelligent manual transmission this time around could be offered in more variants than one. The 1.4 litre turbo petrol will continue to get the DCT automatic and the 1.5 turbo diesel will get manual and torque converter automatic options. The ADAS functionality with the camera and sensors includes lane departure warning, lane keep assist, forward collision mitigation and driver attention monitoring. Now here the camera is not really picking it up but I can feel slight changes, slight uh, bit of corrections in the steering and that's because of the ADAS functionality that I talked about. There are clear lane markings here in Thailand right now and Every time I'm deviating a little bit here and there or maybe the road is curving a little bit, it's making these slight corrections to the steering wheel to ensure that I am right in the center of the lane. With Hyundai having calibrated ADAS for India now with the Tucson, these safety features are certainly coming to the India spec model. How many? Well, that remains to be seen. The Creta is already considered to be quite a pricey product and that price is likely to go up at least for the top-end variants. If they also make the six airbags standard, it is going to go up across all variants. But I think with the kind of premium poise that they have now managed, in fact, they have increased the premiumness, the premium quotient of the car now with the new design. So with everything that they've done now, I think it will continue to sell in big numbers. It will continue to have that long waiting period that the current Creta is still enjoying. If you've been following our social media handles for a while now, then you're aware that the third edition of the Frame the Star contest by Mercedes-Benz in partnership with Better Photography and Overdrive recently concluded at the Mercedes-Benz Auto Hangar in Mumbai. Having registered over 1,200 entries initially, the finalists were narrowed down to 16 contestants. Over a span of eight days, the photographers traversed the busy streets of Mumbai, Chennai and Pondicherry to creatively highlight the unique features of the Mercedes-Benz A-Class and the Mercedes-Benz GLA. And after a difficult judging process, in a star-studded evening, the top three participants were announced. Manas Godara and Jerin Joseph George were named the runners-up 
and were awarded their very own GLA miniature while winning an opportunity to work on a photography or video assignment for one of the key products of the year for Mercedes-Benz India. The ground for the grand champion went to Purnendu Kodwani, who has won an all-expense paid trip to the AMG Winter Drive Experience in Europe and who also gets an opportunity to work on a photography or video assignment for one of the key products of the year for Mercedes-Benz India. The evening ended on a high with the reveal of the winning photographs, people enjoying these photographs and sharing unique frame the star moments and experiences. Well, on that note, it's time for us to take a very quick break here on the show. But coming up on the other side, we get you up close and personal with the Ferrari 296 GTB. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. What does an E30 PS electrified mid-range Ferrari look like? It looks like the very stunning Ferrari 296 GTB. It is based out of Maranello. It's the first V6 road-going car to get the Ferrari badge. Here's Simran with all the details. <laughs> In Ferrari's 75-year history, it's used V6s in Formula 1 with spectacular success, which makes one wonder, why haven't they used one in a road car before? Well, all that changes now. But what a fitting tribute. The 296 GTB is a pretty Ferrari in the truest, purest, simplest sense of the word. It's got the proportions and it's got the style of Ferraris of past, but you've also got all the technical details sort of more hidden away. So for example, the air vents to cool the brakes are below the DRLs, the radiators are tucked right back behind the front mesh, and they've got what they call the tea tray to kind of force air under the car. It all comes together to make for a face that looks a lot simpler and beautiful in the way that you're used to seeing Ferraris. Moving back, you've got this hidden sort of roof spoiler that bridges the two buttresses at the rear. You've got these huge air intakes that feed the intercoolers for the engine. Now, Ferrari says that this isn't a successor to the Dino. You know, the last Ferrari V6 that wasn't badged a Ferrari. It's got styling tributes that kind of hark back to the 250 Le Mans, another Ferrari that's often considered the most beautiful of them all. But around here at the back, you get a peek through this clear Lexan deck lid of really what makes the 296 GTB special. This is Ferrari's first V6 engine in a road-going car, but it's also a first in a number of different ways in that it's a 120-degree V6, which means the angle is shallower than a 60-degree V6, for example. Now, there are very few car manufacturers making this configuration of a V6, McLaren and Maserati being one of them. But even though Maserati and Ferrari have that connection, this has nothing to do with the Netuno V6 that's in the MC20. This does have hybrid assistance and it's a plug-in hybrid which you can tell from right there. What you get is the ability to do pure electric journeys up to 25 kilometers and you can hit about 135 on pure electric power alone. Which brings us to the specs of the engine itself. You're looking at 830 PS combined from the two electric motors and this engine. The specs are actually mind-blowing considering where this car is supposed to sit. It's quicker than the F8 Tributo and it's quicker than an A12 GTS. So you're looking at 0 to 100 kmph in 2.9 seconds, 0 to 200 kmph in 7.3 seconds and well over 330 kmph as a top speed. This V6 engine is 30 kg lighter than the V8 2, but the hybrid system adds 130 kg for a total drive weight of 1470 kg. It also has allowed Ferrari to shorten this car's wheelbase some 50 mm compared to the F8 Tributo. Ferrari's side slip control can estimate grip 35% faster, so it can help you out quicker. While there's a new ABS system to help anybody trail brake like a driving pro. I suppose behind the 296 GTB would be the second most exciting place to be because Ferrari's paid special attention to the acoustics of this engine, so much so that they're calling it the Piccolo V12 or small V12. It's a V6 but it sounds like a V12. Now they've done this by engineering eco length headers and piping some of those exhaust noises back into the cabin and we show you what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. 
boys, Ferraris just get their driving position so right. You sit nice and low, the wheel comes out to you and there is so much space just because of the fact that this central tunnel is actually on the floor versus say something like the Roma where it's taking up quite a bit of space in the center. Now of course the instrumentation sort of wraps around you and there's a lot of touch controls. You have your regular Manatino and you have the E-Manatino because this is a hybrid. You do wish that it had a little more physical controls for some stuff. Then again, if this is the future of Ferrari, we're not complaining. Ferrari hasn't revealed the exact price for the 296 GTB, but this car in this spec costs about Rs 5.4 crore ex showroom or about 20 lakh more than an FA Tributo with a similar spec. It's safe to say the 296 GTB is in very rarefied company. Man, what a car. With that, it's time for us to wrap up this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And you can follow our latest updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.